Okay, I'm going to get started and try to pay attention to see if people come that I don't see. I thought I had this set up so people would automatically be able to come in without me having to admit them, but uh, okay. Good morning, Otis. Thank you for coming. Okay, so uh, I want to start the presentation and what I wanted to talk about is understanding uh, the legal difference between um, uh, what I call equitable reparation and compensatory reparations. Uh, to get started, my name is Professor Renelia Randall. I'm a retired professor emeritus from the University of Dayton School of Law. Um, I taught uh, race and racism law for 30 years. In fact, I started the course, taught it every single year for 30 course, and as soon as I retired, they got rid of it, which makes me skeptical about how to make institutional changes, but that's another story. Um, I taught uh, criminal law and torts law for a while, and I taught remedies. Uh, I taught remedies for the last five years. And the remedies is really relevant to uh, our discussion of reparations because, as I would tell students, uh, tort law and criminal law is about do I have a claim? Contract law, can I win in a claim? Or the opposite, can someone do, am I going to go to jail? Uh, can someone get money from me from thing for a tort injury? Can I renege on this contract? That's what those cases are about. But remedies is about, okay, I won. What does that mean? What can I get? And, and people don't realize that there's some very specific definitions of, and consequences about choices you make. Uh, in terms of what it is you want and what it is you can get. Now, I understand that uh, when we talk about reparations, we're not talking about having won a claim in court and consequently are, 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 uh, are capable of getting money through that legal. But I think it's worth understanding remedies so that we can frame our discussion right. And I got that, I thought about having this discussion when I watched discussion on reparations because people were talking about two different remedies of repara uh, for reparations and was going against reparations because of the different remedies as opposed to whether reparation is owed as much as what is the form reparation should come in. Uh, and I think that's important uh, to, to recognize that so that when you hear people saying, well, I don't want to get paid, then you can say, well, wait a minute. Does that mean you don't want these other things that are possible with reparations? So my discussion today is going to be, I'm going to, real quickly, I only have four slides. I'm going to go through some legal terminology. I'm going to talk about uh, what that means for reparations. And then I'm going to give an example um, of why I think equitable reparations is what we need to talk about. Oh, so in the law, we have what's called a compensatory remedy. Most of us, most of you all are real familiar with this. This is when they sue someone and they get some money. Compensatory remedy is not about fixing the harm. It's about giving you money because you were done wrong. And the money is tied to the harm so that how much money you can get it's based on the harm that was caused to you, but it's not at all about uh, say, fixing that harm. The harm may or may not be fixed. It may or may not can be fixed. And it's always money. So it's, it, it, you're going you're gonna to go to court, you're going to get a sum of money, and that sum of money has to do 
it has to, if you have uh, medical injuries that is going to last your lifetime, whatever money you get in court is going to have to last your lifetime. Um, you cannot go back to court, even if you come up with some additional injury. Let's say that at the time you go to court, you don't realize that you're going to have this back pain that's going to get progressively worse and immobilize you. You go to court, you sue, you get money based on the injuries that you, you uh, identify, but you don't realize that you have this really significant injury. Can you go back and get more money? No. Your claim is over. Whatever you didn't get in that first go around, but that's, that's gone. And so that's compensatory remedy. Uh, and it's always damages. Uh, there are different kinds of damages. Uh, and I'm not going to get in teaching a remedy for it. But the whole idea is that when you talk about compensus, compensation, you're only talking about money. Okay. The court recognized what well, money doesn't always. Uh, cover what is the problem. Uh, sometimes money is inadequate. Sometimes you don't. You want something others than money. Uh, an example of this has uh, that's been going on years now is, and I can't remember the name of the tribe. The tribe lost some land illegally, a lot of land. I think it was one of those big national parks. They sued under the treaty, they lost that land illegally, and they sued in court. Somebody needs to mute their uh, microphone. Um, the tribe sued in court to uh, recover their land. They did an equ they wanted an equitable remedy. That's what equity means. Equity means that you don't necessarily get money, although money can be a part of it. But what you really want is something tangible. And uh, you get the court to order the other people to do it or give it to you. Okay. And this tribe went to court, won in court, asked for the land, and the court said, No, we're not going to give you the land back. We're going to give you money. The court and the tribe said, well, Hey, wait a minute. We didn't ask for money. We don't want money. We want our land. You say, according to the law, we are entitled to have our land and we want our land back. The court refused, gave them millions of dollars, and though that money has been sitting in trust ever since because the tribe refuses to take it. Because once they take it, they can never get the land. Okay, so that's the other thing. Once you take money, you can't go back and say, you know, I made a mistake. I really want an equitable remedy. Uh, equitable remedies include uh, ordering institutions to change. We call it injunction. But that's basically it's the Brown versus Board of Education and all of the injunctions that ordered uh, uh, or the institutions to change. Now, obviously, there's some problems. This is not clean because you, if the court is unwilling to enforce the injunctions they give, then the institution may just say, yeah, you, uh, the court told me to do X, but hey, what are they going to do about it? Um, getting specific performance, that is getting specific things. Hey, we want X, Y, Z. We want the land. We want the car. We want the contract. We don't want money. We want performance of a specific thing. And it also can include monies. They're not called damages because it's not damages, but it is money because money is a part of what is necessary to make you whole. It's, so it, it's not an either either money or no money, it's just money calls something else, okay? The key here is under equitable remedies, the wrongdoer is responsible until it's fixed. 
So they don't get out of, they, you know, if the court ordered them to do X, Y, and Z, and they only do Z, they still are on the hook for X and Y, okay? Uh, and so uh, the wrongdoer stays on the hook longer with equitable uh, remedies. So what does this mean for reparations? Well, it's clear that people have been talking about two different types of reparations. There are all the people who are saying, hey, I want to get paid. I want money. My ancestors lost all this money during slavery, economic loss, calculate the wages, divide it up, give it to me. That's compensatory. Like I said, if, if we go for once uh, uh, compensatory reparation, uh, once it's paid, there's no further obligation. The other problem, because people keep pointing to all of these groups that got reparations, and mostly it was compensatory reparations, and if you take a deep look at it, totally inadequate. That is, uh, I'll give you the example. Japanese American internment in the uh, in 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 in, uh, in concentration camps. During that internment, loss uh, resulted. They were farmers out in California that had turned the land into a profitable market, and was in. And they lost all that land. They lost all that land. Think about it farming land in California. The reparations was $21,000 unless they could show. But of course, who, where were the records that they could show? So for most people, they only got $21,000 for that internment. So part of the issue may be that compensation, uh, reparations, the German reparations, Germans got reparations, but it's just a small monthly amount. Uh, it, so uh, I think people need to be careful about saying you want compensatory reparations and calculating the damage and having that, having something less be given, that's one problem, or B, the calculations are inadequate. Equitable reparations starts a little different. You establish first what the harm is, and then secondly, you establish what constitutes repair. So what you want is for them to repair the harm that was done, okay? And then if it's articulated like that, they could be on the hook for a plan for centuries, depending on what the harm is. Because until the harm is removed, the uh, the government would be obligated to continue the process until the repair is accomplished. I'm not sure that anybody's really talking that specifically about equitable reparations. People are saying, well, we want money for the HBCUs, we want this, this, and this, but there doesn't seem to be a coherent, what is the harm, how is it going to be fixed in uh, this is why what we want is important. I think that uh, we should focus on health disparities as the harm, and only health disparities as the harm. Why? Because it has been measured for, for, for going back into slavery. You can find research showing the difference in the health between enslaved people and uh, uh, whites, the difference in the health between free blacks and white, coming all the way up through segregation, going all the way through civil rights, and, in, uh, and even up to the day, you can find research supporting the idea that there's a health disparity. Now, the other important thing about uh, having the health disparities as, the, uh, as a measurement is that all of health has adopted something called social determinants of health, which basically says 
first, there's all these things that contribute to why people are unhealthy. And if you want to improve their health, you've got to do all of these things. You have to uh, deal with wealth and income. You have to deal with education. You have to deal with criminal justice. You have to deal with environment, healthcare, housing, employment. You have to deal with the stress due to racism and discrimination. And so each one of those would need to be looked at in a plan articulated as to how the those social determinants in African in, in Deus, descendants of African enslaved in the United States, contribute to health disparities. And then the reparations would be doing whatever is necessary to get our health disparities up to where whites are. So that's the gap that we we want to remove that gap. That's the harm that was caused, the institution of a gap, and we're going to repair the harm by eliminating the health disparities and doing what is necessary uh, to do that. Uh, uh, to, uh, to do that. Uh, so just to recap, I mean, because I really uh, wanted to, uh, we can have some discussion when people talk about wanting to be paid they're talking about compensation and when people talking about wanting things done they talking about equitable uh but they can be in both that is you can have equitable reparations that not only because that not only works on all these systems but also end up giving people money because you are not going to be able to improve wealth disparity without getting a uh, transfer of resources uh, to uh, dais. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just open it up for us to talk because uh, I have uh, my slides will be available for Patreons. Uh, the this will you, this will be uh, I'm recording it, so this will be uh, reformatted into and posted on YouTube. Uh, so uh, let's open it up for some uh, discussion. Just talk. We don't have that many people, and so if people have something they want to say or a comment or something, if you want me to go back to a slide, let me know. Dr. Randall, how can we make sure that this is part of the political agenda that um, that the well for our leaders that are um, for African American leaders that are supposed to be speaking on behalf of the community, and that doesn't always happen at all. Um, that they actually know what they're talking about. Yeah, I. That's a great question. How how can we be sure? It seems to me we have a, a lot of parties who have vested different vested interests. Of, and I'm not sure anyone is articulating this, the difference between equitable and compensatory and talking about, well, I shouldn't say anyone. I know there's a lot of people who are doing it. Uh, but on the political scene, you're right. I think right now, this is a political moment, not a real moment. And once politics pass, uh, it'll go back into uh, become less important. So what's important for us now is to make sure that at the end of this process, we're not worse off by what they have established. If they have established commissions and, and, and approaches that are counter to this kind of idea, then, um, and then we'll be worse off for this political moment. What to do? I. You know, I think we need someone to, uh, we need an open letter to everybody so that it's out there in the public. We need someone who can lobby and contact these people and write letters and stuff. Uh, but we need to put this on the record. I, I, that's a good question, and, and, and I've been thinking about it. Like, I can get it with the Bernie Sanders hands. <laughs> okay. 
you know, like I'm a, I'm a progressive, and so I, I do some work with him here in Cleveland, and I've recorded like a national commercial and stuff for him. So like I can, you know, make sure that it's in their hands, and then I can talk to um, the Democratic Party about, you know, um, their stance on things, because I think that um, 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 the party needs to to hear what you just said because. Um, as as in the last election, we have so many people. It's so disjointed, and people just are all over the place that we need to. Unless we have a clear strategy on how to address reparations in the African American community, as usual, we will get screwed. Yeah, I, I understand perfectly. And anything I can do to help, I'm going to. I'm going to take this and try to get it turned. I um I I don't like to write as much as. And, but I'm going to take this uh, and turn it into a, uh, a print and see, and, and see if I can get something published as an open letter. And then we just have to get people like in COBRA and other people working on reparations to begin to articulate like their language more clear, clearly. So that it won't be misused, because that was how everybody's using words at reparations. One of the things when I was uh, when I was doing talking, one of the things I always did before I started to talk would be to define the words that I'm using, because a lot of the arguments that people get in is often over definitions. They're using different definitions, so of course they come to different outcomes. If we are, if we're going to talk about whether or not we have reparations, then people need to identify whether they're talking about compensatory reparations or equitable reparations, because it makes a big difference. And I think that too. I think that the other thing is dealing with racism, the aspect of racism on both sides, on the Democratic Party side. Like people can't tell me that all Democrats are. Um, for African American reparations, like they're not, and no. you know, and and the Republicans, you know, um, Mitch McConnell is a singular voice. There are a few others that sound like him on their side, but there may be some folks that because a lot of the things that have really impacted the African American community around like infant mortality, um, you know, we the legislature has been passed by Republicans. So, you know, how can we? Um, Make sure that like have we have you thought about like doing uh like they they're good for doing these listening tours and all this other stuff but doing a, a listening tour across the country to um to talk about this particular issue and to bring it down to the community because in the end if it's something that we can legislate then if we go to the community and and help them to make sure that they have the right legislation crafted they they won't lose in the end. I think that's an excellent idea. It's not something I can do. Uh, I can, I, yeah, I, I can, I can do stuff that I can sit from my chair and do. So <laughs> I'd be willing, to, I'd be do willing to do a listening tour that was webinars. Okay. If I have some group to organize it, I would do that. No problem. Um, yeah. Uh, People, you know, as far as going in person, it's not something I can do. I no longer have a, <laughs> my school. As soon as I retired, they cut me out of everything, uh, and so I don't have access to any support anymore through my school. Um, uh, uh, so there's not so anything that's going to have to be done is going to have to be done by another organization. But I think the listening to us is a great idea because I think if people understood equitable rep, understood that reparations can be either compensatory or equitable, and we're, and we're wanting equitable, which includes money, and that the measure that we want of when things has been fixed, because under equitable reparations, People have to be responsible until the harm is gone. Well, the harm is the health disparities. And that's going to take a couple of centuries to fix, quite literally. Uh, and But the government would be on the hook that long for doing things, measuring, and they already measure health disparities on a regular basis 
So there's no reason, we're not going to ask them to look at something that they're not already looking at. We're just asking them to, develop, to, with the Black community, put together an approach that would eliminate health disparities, measure whether the health disparities have been eliminated, and, and keep providing the necessary financial resources, which, as I said, includes wealth and income because you can't fix health disparities without fixing wealth and income, education, all of that other stuff. So yeah, I think a listening tour is a great suggestion and I'd be happy to do something if some group wanted to take responsibility for setting them up or just for your own group and organization. Okay. I'd be willing to do something. So I I can see it with the Black East Ohio Black House. Well, you know how I am. So I, I would be definitely willing to do something. Well, introduce yourself so that people will know who when people talk. Oh, I'm Ivanka Hall. I run the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition, which is the first coalition in the state of Ohio to focus, focus exclusively on African-American disparities in education, employment, housing, and health by working to educate, advocate for, and empower the community. Thank you. You're welcome. Dr. Rondo? Yes. Who's speaking? Yes, Robin. Okay. Um, I'm very concerned. Uh, Speak up. There's a disconnect. Robin, your phone, I think you went off and your phone wasn't very good. Robin? Yes. Can you hear me? It's it it has uh, the quality is not so good, but go ahead. Yes, I can hear you. I'm sorry. I, okay. I'm yeah. I'm up in the woods a while. Um, I'm concerned about the framing of this reparations conversation separate uh, from CERD, the Convention of Discrimination. We have a law that's been signed and ratified that speaks to disparate impact and personality. And with the acknowledgement of, of this with reparations, I think that negates the reservation that the U.S. utilizes to non-adherence to CERD. And so we have a legal framework that is shared by the international community concerning uh, racism and discrimination. Uh, specifically with disparate impact and disproportionality. So to me, the conversation of reparations says, yes, uh, U.S. is in violation of CERD, uh, leading to crimes against humanity, but at, at present, a, a, a existing law that the U.S. is signed on to, uh, but uses a reservation not to adhere to, it seems like that's a, 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 a circle of sorts that leads back to CERD. The reparations to me leads back to CERD and the conversation about a U.S. adhering to international law, which opens up the door for reparations and repair and equitable uh, reparations. It seems like that's the missing component to frame this whole conversation around reparations and the acts inside of Congress or inside the political realm still should lead to the legal framework, which is already established. So I'm not hearing that conversation about CERD. As, and of course, you know, I'm fixated on CERD. You put me on that path. But. Well, for people who uh, don't understand, CERD is the Convention on Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which was enacted in 1995. No, excuse me, 1965. United States did not ratify until 1995, Robin, correct me if I get any of these dates wrong. Uh, and even when they ratified it, they do what the United States do all the time with human rights treaty. They made sure that none of the rights were enforceable in the United States uh, as law. Uh, and that's a whole nother video. To, uh, to your question, uh, Robin, I do, there isn't a lot of conversation on CERD. I do think for people who want to do CERD 
and I'm one of those that reparations is a part of that discussion. But I don't know that reparate people who are just interested in reparation needs to adopt CERD as a way to look at this. Because I have to tell you, my concern is moving people into thinking about equitable reparations. And maybe, sir, this is what you're saying. Sir, if we can get people to talk about equitable reparations and, and, and what that means, sir has a framework for dealing with those rights and getting them um, uh, 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 on an international level. I, I think we should be doing sir. I think that it should be a part of the conversation but I don't know that it has to be a part of the conversation. That is, I, I don't know that if we don't do third, we can't do reparations. If we don't do third, we can't do reparations. I'm saying I don't believe that. I think we can do reparations without third. We can do third without reparations. They both enhance each other, but they are not tied together in such a way that uh, one is necessary for the other. Well, tell me this. Right now, reparation is in the political arena, but ultimately, if some kind of codified uh, uh, law, it, it goes into the legal realm then. And it then does fall under third. If, if any legislation comes out of this reparations, it, it has to have this uh, uh, impact in international law that the U.S. is already signed on to. I mean, but so, I, I, I mean, I, it, it, I, I understand the third argument, and I, I and I agree. I just don't know that the, just because there's an argument. People who want to get third, I think you're right that you can use the reparations as an argument for why are you doing, why you're not, uh, if you go back to my slide, uh, oh, let me go back, let me share for a minute. Uh, oh. Okay. If you go back to the slide that I had here, that in order to eliminate health disparities, you're going to have to eliminate the, you're going to have to reduce the stress due to racism and discrimination. In order to reduce the stress to racism and discrimination, you're going to have to eliminate all forms of racial discrimination. That includes eliminating negligent discrimination, which is legal now. People can discriminate in the United States negligently. It would also, you need to eliminate reckless discrimination, which is legal in the United States. And so one of the problems, the only illegal discrimination in the United States is intentional. So one of the things, if we're going to improve health disparities, get rid of the gap, not just in, not improve the health. That's what everybody wants to talk about. I am not talking about improving the health of people. I'm in talking about getting the gap, getting rid of the gap between blacks and whites. If we're going to do that, you're going to have to eliminate stress through the racial discrimination. And third, and this is the point I think you're making, provides a framework for doing it. Yes. Okay. But third, I don't think, and I think this is why it's important to get some framework like this into the discussion um, so that all of these different things like eliminating racial discrimination as a part of addressing the harm done by slavery and segregation. The harm the argument that I would make is slavery and segregation caused health disparities. Stress due to racism and discrimination makes it worse. Anybody in the law understands that you are responsible for the situation people find them in and the harm that is caused by that situation. So you're there, that is stress due to racism and discrimination is a part of the harm caused by slavery and segregation. And third, 
Definitely. And also getting rid of racial discrimination and disparities in all these other areas. But uh, if that's what you mean by third, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, yes. Um, so the other question that I have, so I guess it's two. So one is, um, who's if, talking? This is Yvonne. I'm sorry. Okay. So if if you're if we're talking about um, utilizing sir, so can 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 sir be placed into a policy legislative? Like if you if we write up legislation around equitable res, um, reparations and include the language from third in there and then additional languages um to actually beef up the cause like this is this is why um yeah. that could be something that could be a template that they could that can be used across the country yeah and i think this is the the city uh the human rights cities i think that's a part of it Part of the problem we have with CERD now is the United States has a long-standing position that they take on human rights, which is we sign the treaties, but we put reservations. Reservations is just another word for restrictions. And so under international law and in, 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 in under this, under, uh, what is it? Um, United Nations and international law, countries can only be responsible for things they agree to. So th there is no forcing for the most part, especially in the area of human rights. And so what happens is countries sign these human rights treaties, but then they limit their applicability. And the United States has done that with CERD. Now CERD doesn't actually use the language that I use, negligent discrimination or reckless discrimination. And CERD just says that every country has to get rid of all forms of racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. The United States has not, getting, has not gotten rid of, of, of uh, negligent discrimination or reckless discrimination, then they are in violation of the Treaty of CERD. Now, the United States is going to argue that you're only responsible, they are only responsible under their reservation to do things that are consistent with our Constitution. And our Constitution, uh, they have interpreted, which means it can be changed, mm -hmm. to not to only include intentional discrimination as a part of the of the Civil Rights Act and uh, other things like that. But yeah, going back to your comment, I think the most effective thing would be to start using the language of CERD everywhere you can and right. then pointing to the fact that the United States has already signed on to this treaty, ignoring the reservations. They've already signed on to this treaty, and so we should be adopting the language of this treaty into different policy and law. And in fact, that's the, that's the reason it's not. The, the, the United States does a two-step process with human rights treaties that they don't do with other treaties. The first part, it has to be ratified. All treaties have to be ratified. The second part, though, is a specific law has to be passed implementing the treaty. The ratification doesn't implement the treaty. It doesn't do anything. And no law has been, in fact, that's the problem with all our human rights laws. Mm -hmm. No law has been passed implementing the treaty. So it's not law in the United States. And so to anything you can do, put it into law, either through policies or on a city level. You yeah. can adopt it in uh, the Cleveland to get that in their code. And then Cleveland would become a human rights city, a third city, and the third language in law would be law in Cleveland. So yeah, that's a, that, that's, that's a good idea. But only, I, I say that because, this is Ivanka again, because you know, we have that, when we talk about health disparities, they, and in the government now, they have that health disparities in all policies piece. You know, that they're, you know, this health disparity should be in all policies. And so, right. you know, maybe if we're looking at the same thing and saying, if we have equitable reparations in all policies, 
Yeah. So it's all health disparity policies. Right. Um, and then we're asking for that piece. But what, I, what I'm saying is, like, I, I'm, I understand that some parts of SER could be challenged. So if we actually just take out the parts that we need, like pull parts from there um, that are looking at are either city or county or state, um, like create a, a state legislation and then put the pieces in there that we need, but then make sure that we're including this um, equitable reparations um, in all um, health disparity policies. Yeah. And then that way, any kind of any kind of dollars that are coming in around policy issues related to health disparities have to address the equitable reparations piece. And then once you do that, they have to address wealth and income, education, housing, food, uh, uh, mm -hmm. targeting, all of those things come on the table in a way that they don't necessarily come on the table in it in other areas if you just look at other areas and it makes it clean to talk about mm -hmm. so, so dr randall if i can remind you that the universal periodic review we were on a third task force there was a national plan to be pro offered to the 25 violations of human rights by the united states they did not push that national plan, which to me, reparation is a part of, uh, to deal with uh, the history of violating uh, uh, human rights and discrimination. And as it relates to our constitution and intentionality in which we have to prove intentionality on the part of the discriminator, there's no economic or political rights inside our US constitution. So we must lean on the uh, uh, universal laws as, as relates to uh, international law. Now, I recently got involved with the Human Rights City Alliance for this reason, Dr. Randall, which is to try to enable surge and that surge into uh, uh, local municipal law and ordinance. The city I'm in in Grand Rapids, Michigan, has recently uh, enacted in local ordinance, uh, a 911 ordinance. They call it a human rights ordinance, but it's basically a barbecue Becky ordinance. But it's, it's an inroad to human rights on, on the local level. And if SIR can be enacted on a local level, then it will scale up. But uh, for us to expect the federal government to go down with, with protection has not historically been a reality. So no. my efforts are around in that heard locally no that's i think I, I, that that the best bet is working on surge locally i mean uh wherever you're local uh if you're in a good state it might be a good idea if you to do a statewide thing if in fact you're in a state but i do think this uh the 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 human rights cities approach is the only thing going to work in the united states we tried and and robin i know you were uh, during obama's administration we tried to because one of the things third requires is for the national government to uh, uh educate its citizens about the human rights treaties and and responsibility which of course they don't do at all and we tried to get obama to change the office of civil rights to the office of civil rights and human rights and he wouldn't do it. He didn't participate in. Um, uh, so the, 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 there's been a long-standing human approach to human rights, which every administration has done. And part of, I think, rep, to get back to the equitable versus the uh, um, uh, compensatory rep, uh, reparations, I think that rep, I think third. I think people who are advocating for surge should advocate for reparations as a part of surge. But I'm not sure that I want to mess it up discussion of reparations with surge. That is people who are advocating for reparations having to put in the surge discussion. Until we get down to making a specific plan, and then we say, in order to implement this plan, you're going to have to eliminate all forms of racial discrimination, which means that you're going to have to ratify CERD 
and and make it the law of the land. But I think it's too early to bring that discussion in. So what would you start off with first? Ivanka, Ivanka. So what would you start off with first? So like we were just talking about like crafting some type of legislation that we could use and share it across. Well, the I think that's fine. I think you should draft legislation. You can put in reparations. You can put in CERD on a city level. But I'm saying, yeah, no, I'm not suggesting that you need to separate it out when you go to work on it on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But I'm thinking, I'm, I guess I'm thinking back to the discussion we were having about educating people about uh, mm -hmm. the difference between tens of compensatory regulation and and um and um, uh, uh equitable reparations my concern about putting third in is is if people don't understand reparations third just confuses it, it even more and but can you as part of the listening tour actually have the legislative piece um there and then have the definitions exactly. that are available and then say like these are the definitions of it, but this is the legislation that we've crafted that um, will help meet the goal that we need in order for us. And part of the part of the thing that we need crafted is third. Don't get me wrong; I am not suggesting not advocating for third. I am, I, I am an advocate for third, and and I believe it is. But I also realize that if you that when you're trying to your audience. If your audience is here about reparations and you bring in surge, you confuse the issue. If your audience is about surge and you bring in reparations, you confuse the issue. You have to understand what your audience is there to understand. And then once you get them to understand that component, you move into the second part. Uh, Miranda, those are parents. I don't think they have to be linked up in a way that they're always discussed together. They're, they're parallel tracks, perhaps, but there's a legal track as well as a political track on this. And the legal track needs to be brought up because there was a national plan for the nation's drop and inherent in the national plan. Remember, we had that. Uh, uh, the opportunity to present a national plan, and then we just walked away from the you know, human rights network because it's it a national I'm, plan that. Yeah, I, I I I understand. I just I and and I think that we're having a higher level of discussion here because the people here have a really good understanding and movement. But if we're talking about getting people to understand reparations. They, uh, then we have to not get that confused with understanding CERD. They're two different things, and 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 the same, and the vice versa. But if, if, when you're trying to work with people on CERD, if you introduce a discussion of reparations, you'll pull them off of the discussion of CERD because they will be trying to figure out, well, what does this have to do with this? And I don't understand, and you will have lost them. So two parallel tracks except I, to the point when you get to starting talking about making policies and stuff. Uh, and then you start, yeah, we need CERD because we need to eliminate all forms of racial discrimination. And that's a part of the equitable as a, as, Anyone else? So we've got to use human rights. Go ahead. I wanted to mention, Dr. Ray, right now we're under uh, a time period to, for all cities to put forward a universal periodic review. We're doing webinars on how your local, ag your local agency cause or whatever can render a re uh, to the United Nations as a release to or, or reparations or any violations uh, that are going on in under the convention. So we're in a period, I wonder if reparations should be part of that uh, uh, U.S. Human Rights City uh, uh, organizing apparatus. Absolutely. I think that that anyone who's writing on uh, uh, the, the, the third requires a periodic review, which is coming up in 2020. Right. 
the report to yes. do in September. And in fact, I've been thinking of redoing yes. one I did on health. Uh, report to do uh, in September. Any NGO, Vanka, uh, any NGO can write a report and submit it. Okay. A non governmental organization can write a report. And they like reports that are locally based. Okay. Uh, that are kind of bringing cool. stories and stuff like that. So you can write a report, and the purpose of the periodic review is to say, okay, how is the United States meeting its human rights obligations under its uh, treaty, Convention on Elimination on All Forms of Racial Discrimination? Uh, it happens, what, every two years, Robin? Or is it? Three years. Four and a half years. Four Every and four and a half years. years. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so allowing, this is, so uh, yeah. We have a world now. So, so yeah, the, the uh, US, US, cities can do it, organizations can do it, not, any non governmental organization can do a, a, a report on what they, the status is. And they, and then they just, statistics is important to them. I do a lot of statistics, but stories are also, uh, and so they kind of want to do that. So yeah, you that that would be a place to combine. You're right, Robin. That would be a place to combine both a discussion of of uh, the lack of compliance with third and the lack of compliance uh, and the lack of reparations. So Dr. Randall, we're going to show anybody and everybody how to render this report by September. And the U.S. Human Rights Network, as they pay for the, for the Cities Alliance, Human Rights Cities Alliance, and we are laying out webinars on how to produce this report by September for okay. anybody that wants to weigh in with policy. So we've been almost an hour. I want to turn this back because I said 30 minutes, but I knew we would have a good discussion. So I want to turn this back to, uh, I, I want to just quickly go through because I know some people came on late and I want to just quickly refresh people what I said that, uh, oh, where am I? Okay. Rep Compensatory reparation is about just getting money. You hear a lot of young people say, I want my check, I want my check. So they calculate the damages and, and once paid, there's no further obligation. Uh, even if what you get is inadequate, uh, which I guarantee you it will be horribly inadequate. Equitable. Uh, reparate, based on past history of reparations, based on past history of reparations to Japanese, German, all of these people we identify, again, they got inadequate reparations. If we go for compensatory reparations, we're likely to get inadequate reparations as well. Equitable reparations is about what, hey, we want you to fix the harm. We have identified a harm and we want you to fix it. And you don't get off the hook until the harm is fixed. And I'm suggesting that that harm should be health disparities because there's plenty of research that shows that health disparities is connected to slavery and segregation. There's, there's health people accept without question that there's an intergenerational impact of of, uh, on health and intergenerational impact of stress. So this would be hard for people to argue, well, how can you prove that it's not connected to slavery and segregation? I'm like, hey, the white health people have done it. Uh, and then once you do that, every area, because health people have always already accepted social determinants of health that you can't improve uh, you can't eliminate health disparities without addressing the health, uh, social determinants of health. So I thank you all for coming. My slides are available for Patreon. My, the slides are available for Patreons, uh, which is 
uh, you go to patreon.com and put in Prof. B. Randall and uh, sign up to be a Patreon. And I will be posting the slides up there. Anyone who's already a Patreon, patron would, uh, will get a, a copy uh, to their subscription. Uh, I will be turning this uh, presentation into a YouTube, which a general link. Uh, and if uh, if there's any other discussion or comment, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh huh. Bye bye.